And our next speaker is Tom Sidwell. Uh, he's a rancher with JX Ranch, and you're going to have to help me with the, Tucum Say it again. Tucum Carry. Tucum Did I say it right? Tucum Carry. Tucum Carry. Oh, God. Sorry, I'm, I'm still in like the Santa Barbara thing here going, so excuse me. Uh, Tom and Mimi Sidwell are some of the best drought managers in the region. Although the JX Ranch has received less than half the usual amount of precipitation in the past three years, the land has forage and the Sidwell's grass-fed beef business is doing well. The key, planning for drought. In, this, in the conference, Tom will share the details of his management philosophy and practices. So the title of his talk is named Managing for Drought on the JX Ranch. Please give a warm welcome to Tom Sidwell. And thank you for uh, inviting us to speak here. And uh, Dr. Overpeck's presentation was a little bit depressing. And I was just going to throw my hands up and go home. <clears throat> but I never met a challenge I didn't like. And so the key to what he was saying was adapt, adaptation. And so that really plays into what we're talking about here is adapting and managing for drought. So how are we coping for, with the drought? What are we doing? What strategies do we use? First of all, what is a drought? And in simple terms, a drought is a period of unusually dry weather that persists long enough to cause environmental or economic problems such as crop damage, rangeland damage, water supply uh, shortages, and so on and so forth. Along with drought, we usually have dust storms. The picture on the left uh, is Stratford, Texas, the dust storm in the 1930s, and of course that's, it, everybody knows about the dust storms of 1930s. But earlier this year on our ranch, uh, and, and, and I'll let you know we, we ranch 25 miles south of Tucumcari, New Mexico, in the northeast part of the state right along the cap rock and uh, a lot of dry land farms on top of the cap rock and so what you see here is the dust coming off those land uh, those uh, dry land farms and there's enough dust there to to block out the sun there and uh, so things were beginning to get a little bit serious earlier this spring so in in june at the height of the drought i guess you would say um, New Mexico was undergoing the worst, the driest period in the last 120 years, in the last, in, in recorded history. And, uh, but in September, we did get some very nice rains, and you can see how quickly it changed. However, this drought ain't over, not by a long shot. The uh, uh, drought uh, outlook for the period from October 17 to January 31st, it shows the drought in a major portion of New Mexico to persist or intensify. And uh, we really pay a lot of attention to uh, uh, forecasts and, and, and really listen to what, uh, what they're saying. Some of the effects of drought on vegetation is grass mortality. And um, you can see uh, some of the dead grasses there, um, primarily blue grama that uh, in 2011 when it was so hot and dry and we had very little rain and just a lot of grass died and uh, you know we managed pretty intensively and you still have grass that dies and that's just the effect of drought we just have that's something we just have to live with also what we're seeing is that brush invasion takes place during the drought um, right here is uh, mesquite seedlings and those are pretty young you know they they became established in in uh, 2011 2010 uh, here's uh, juniper seedlings you can see right there the little choya cactus and uh, we have a lot of them you just don't really see them until you get out there and you look down on the ground and there's a lot of it that became established in the last two or three years uh, that, that can be a little bit disconcerting, but um, uh, we deal with it. So what are the strategies that we use to manage for drought on our, on our ranch? Uh, first, we use grazing planning, utilizing the HRM principles and concepts that will maximize the quantity and quality of the forage while providing for a maximum physiological rest for the vegetation. Um, 
another strategy is that we plan for a drought. Every year I plan for a drought. And uh, basically we allocate the available forage for a specified future period of time. We know we're going to have a drought. We don't know when, so we plan for it. We're also planning for the drought before it occurs instead of reacting to the drought after it takes place. The majority of ranchers will react to a drought. Um, and I'll show later on um, how we plan, how we a uh, act, the actions uh, that we take uh, instead of reacting. We also conserve, uh, I mean, we also uh, control invasive species that consume large amounts of water. We have a lot of mesquite, we have a lot of uh, juniper trees that were not native to a lot of these um, uh, soils and um, they consume a large amount of water. And we see quite a number of wells that are decreasing in uh, quantity of water and uh, as well as uh, going dry. Another strategy that we use to manage for drought is to add value to our product and that helps a lot when you, when you have to have uh, when you're running lower stocking rates and uh, we do this through our grass-fed beef we'll go through that in a little while too but the first strategy we'll talk about is grazing planning when we purchased the ranch in 2003 uh, we had uh, basically eight pastures on that ranch um, there wasn't any kind of water systems on it the wells are weak they pump off you know, we're look, talking about half gallon to one gallon minute wells. Um, and when your long-term goal is to run one herd of cattle, you've got to have water for them. Uh, this was quite a challenge. Um, but we started uh, with two herds. And uh, so we, we, our average grazing period was 18 days. Average rest period was 90 days. That is a whole lot better than what than the continuous year-long grazing that had been going on on the ranch for many, many, many years. It's an improvement. In 2013 now, we have 25 pastures. Our, our average grazing period is four days, and our average rest period is 105 days. We run one herd of cattle, and, uh, and, and it has made a world of, uh, of difference. This slide was taken at uh, a ranch that I managed uh, in the Capitan Mountains, G Bar F Ranch. And uh, we had, uh, this is the uh, G Bar F on, on the left side and continuous year long grazing on the, on the right side. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty contrast, it's a picture of many contrasts there. And, and what I noticed just walking around in there is that each one of those seed stalks sticking above the snow is a solar collector and you can see that snow just melting a little bit around each one of those we're gaining effective precipitation on this side of the fence versus this side of the fence where that snow will just stay there and evaporate into the air and uh, is eventually just a, a, a sheet of uh, dry ice and there's very little precipitation that uh, uh, will go into that soil so As a result, um, on that particular ranch, we saw some of our water well uh, levels increase. And, and what's interesting is that these are, whoops, these are not uh, my figures. These are the uh, New Mexico State Engineers figures. They started um, uh, measuring some of these wells in 1959 and 1957. And uh, so, in 1988 is when I started implementing holistic resource management on this ranch. That was their last reading uh, measurement. And then in, in uh, 93 was their next measurement. So we had five years of, of uh, HRM and grazing planning on that particular ranch there. In those five years, that water level rose 28 feet. And that's the first time, that's, that's the most water it's had in it since 19... 59 and, and probably many years before. And um, on the bottom graph, uh, the well w water levels were 302, 303 feet. And in 93, it was uh, 299 feet, which is pretty significant, I think, for that depth. So did we get more rain? Thank you. You know, 
I hear, oh, yeah, it rains up there all the time. You always get more rain. Well, did we now? So 57-year uh, average of Captan, 16.9 inches. And, and this, this uh, uh, bar right there shows that the average over the previous four years was about 13 and a half. So we didn't get more rain. But what rain we got did get was more effectively used, and that's, that's very critical to, uh, to grazing planning. You'll see that in grazing planning if you, uh, uh, we can get uh, a lot more water into the soil, into the uh, um, grass production, and, and, and so on. So this was another ranch that I managed in uh, Marathon, Texas. Here we have 535 cattle through 54 pastures. Uh, one day grazing period with 90 days of rest. So each pasture is rested 98% of the year. I wanted to just kind of show, you know, there's some animal impact. You can get some real good hoof action when you put out stimulants like uh, in the winter time, such as uh, range cubes and things like that. And and the the impact they have on the soil surface is pretty remarkable. On the grass, they incorporate litter into the soil. Um, which eventually increases the organic matter and soil uh, holding capability of the soil and, and so forth. And, and over a period of years, will you start to see some real results from that. So here we are on the JX Ranch, three years into the drought. This is grazing planting. This is our ranch on the left side here. This is another uh, ranch here, continuous year-long grazing. Uh, you can see Three years into the drought, we still had some grass standing litter. We had Russian thistle over here. It was all gone. They had taken their cattle off in October the previous fall. And this is active wind erosion. And, uh, but our vegetation is holding that soil. So we're, we're, we're gaining acreage, I guess. I don't know. We're getting, so we're getting more soil and the ranch is growing bigger. I don't know. So. But um, also another thing that, that, that uh, you can see is litter on the ground. And although it's not much, we're three years into a very severe drought. And this protects the soil, this holds the soil together, that keeps it from eroding. Um, uh, what little moisture you do get, what little precip you do get, uh, it, it will, it will slow evaporation from the soil and it's just these little little increments of improvement that that keep adding up over time this is further down about a, about a mile down the fence line um, and this is in April so we had a little bit more rain it was a whole quarter inch more rain from January to April and and that's not much but look at the grass on our side of the fence how it's responding to that little bit of moisture. You don't see the grass over here on the other side of the fence. You see a lot of weeds. You see a lot of weeds here, but look at the litter that's on the soil surface. Another thing that uh, is remarkable is the differences in the co soil color. And <clears throat> that the question when I heard Dr. Overpeck talking about long range uh, um, radiation on this side of the fence, I would assume that you have less long-range radiation bouncing back from the soil than you would here. Um, and and uh, uh, another thing, on Google Earth, this fence line shows up just unbelievable. This is a close-up. And... Um, you can see the grass, what little grass there is. It's putting up a little bit of growth. And like I said, we had just a quarter of an inch from January to April. But the litter that's on the ground, the soil surface is being protected. What moisture does fall on the ground is not so apt to evaporate as it does over here on this side. And uh, there's less erosion. Um, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Another fence line on the other side of the ranch, and this is in August, and we see grazing planting here. 
Um, this is uh, our side of the fence. This is uh, continuous year-long grazing on the right side of the fence. We had a few showers in, in July and August. And uh, so you can see the response of the grass. And this is from the grass being healthy, more vigorous, having healthier root systems that can reach down and, and, and um, take advantage of that uh, little bit of moisture that you do get. Over here, you still have a lot of bare ground. We have a lot of bare ground also, but you can still see a little bit of litter here in places. Um, the response to the grass on the continuous year-long side is, is really slower. This helps us to cope with drought a whole lot easier right there. We're making more forage and um, for wildlife, for watershed, for our livestock, um, and, and uh, it's just like putting money in the bank. It's there for you for the next time. A month later, we had uh, some good rains in September. We had 2.8 inches. Um, we had some neighbors that had 11 inches and, and others that had two inches. So it was varied widely, but we had 2.8 inches. And you can see how the grass has responded tremendously versus over here. Again, Grass plants are a lot healthier, more vigorous, and, uh, and then we also have a, a, a greater diversity of grasses. And this is shooting across, this picture is across uh, uh, perpendicular, and look at the length of those leaves. This is after three years of drought, and one, you know, two good days of rain, and that grass has responded like this, versus over here, it's still struggling. It's, those roots are, are hurting. And uh, you see we've got broadleaf plants. There's more solar conversion here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's just a healthier ecosystem. Grazing planting, you know, we have 25 pastures and, <clears throat> and uh, um, that it, it uh, makes a big difference on our arroyo channels on the slopes. You can see here in uh, 2005 the bare ground right here. 2013 it's beginning to revegetate. You can see uh, the channel here it's beginning to narrow up a little bit. And so every time we have a flood event this is going to catch more and more sediment and we'll begin to see more, um, more or we'll begin to see this channel begin to narrow up more begin to see the bank build up more, and uh, we're seeing uh, burrow brush becoming established in here, and uh, western wheatgrass, just things that'll sure hold, hold that uh, bank and catch that sediment. This is just strictly from, from uh, grazing planning, grazing management. We've also seen a big increase in our four-wing salt bush. When we moved there, I saw two four-wing saltbush plants, and, and they were both dead or they looked dead. The branches were laying on the ground. They'd been smashed down, and it just looked pretty tough. And I don't know when this happened. I was asleep, I guess, but all of a sudden, a few years later, boy, here's all this four-wing saltbush. And, and uh, we're seeing, even through the drought, we're seeing uh, some uh, seedlings become established. And uh, I see four-wing saltbush coming in in all of our pastures now. This is great for wildlife. It's great for the cattle. It extends the grazing season or the palatable uh, grazing for livestock longer in the year. Um, uh, but for a deer, we're starting to see a lot more uh, deer hang out in these areas like this. And uh, it's a wonderful browse. And this grass is just... Um, Makes me hungry looking at it. <laughs> so another strategy that we use is drought planning. So basically we plan for a drought before it occurs instead of reacting to it. We know we're going to have a drought. We don't know when, so we plan for it. And the purpose is to allocate the current available forage for a planned period of time and adjust our stocking rate accordingly. And, and we take into account other resource needs such as wildlife, watershed, etc. Monitor the drought plan and replan as needed. 
My favorite saying when I hear a lot of ranchers talking about how bad the drought is, I'll listen for a while and then I'll say, you know, I plan for the drought and so far everything's going according to plan. <laughs> they don't like to hear that. Mimi doesn't even like to hear it. <laughs> And so these next few slides, I'm going to take you through um, the present drought and kind of the thought processes and what we looked at um, on planning for the drought, on adjusting our stocking rates, and on into next year. So <clears throat> this and, and, and these slides are all going to be the, the, the same uh, photo point. So in 2010, we had a great year, 18.3 inches. So the, in the fall of 2010, this is what I look at. And I want to allocate forage. I want to ask a question. Do I have enough forage for the cattle that we have today for X number of days? And if not, then how many cattle do I need to reduce by? Or if we have more forage than necessary, then how many cattle can I add? And, and so in our stocking rate, for 2010 was 39% above conventional stocking rate. Forage assessment showed that we could run our present number of cows. We could hold our weaned calves over until spring and add 10 more cows. And, but we didn't add any more cows. But we were able to hold our weaned calves over. Part of them go into the uh, 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 grass-fed beef enterprise. And then the rest of them we sell to a uh, uh, grass-fed producer in, in Kansas. And, uh, but we add value when we do that. So in 2011, we are rocked along uh, the drought planning and forage assessment that we did in the fall of 2010, where we were 39% above ranch capacity. Well, in 2011, very dry, very hot and windy. We're still 39% above ranch capacity. We didn't get much rain. We're still living off of 2010 grass right here. So by July, we had received very little rain, and the temperatures were hot and windy. The 90-day forecast showed that uh, it's going to be hotter and drier than normal from August through October. That pretty well takes care of the growing season. And we made a decision then that we were going to have to sell some cattle. We don't know how many we'll have to sell until do the forage assessment. The, the drought planning from 2010 still showed we had plenty of grass to go ahead and get through uh, until November of 2011. So we were very confident, um, uh, whereas a lot of other people had been selling their cattle through the summer of 2011. We knew we had the forage because we planned for it and to be able to keep them until that fall and then make our decision for the coming year. So the forage assessment in October 2011 showed we would need to sell 60% of our numbers, but instead, due to high feed costs and a future drought forecast, we opted to sell 85% of our cows. Hold over the calves until spring, keep enough yearlings to meet our grass-fed meat sales for 2012. Positive cash flow must continue. And uh, uh, with our, with our grass-fed beef, well, it was going to continue and we had to forage to be able to do that through 2012 and we decided to just basically hunker down and ride this thing out so <clears throat> came through 2012 according to plan by golly <laughs> and uh, 2012 was a little better year we had 7.55 uh, inches we're stocked at 28 percent of range capacity so based upon the forage assessment in the fall of 2012, we could buy some cows. And we're meeting the increased grass-fed meat demands of our customers. We still have positive cash flow due to grazing, drought, and financial play, uh, planning. And you can see the vegetation, how it responded in 2012 to um, uh, seven and a half inches of rainfall. And that's all new forage. So we're doing. We're going to do the drought planning for 2013, and and it showed that we could increase our carrying capacity, which was just opposite of what everybody else is doing. And so we did. So here we are at present. 
2013 uh, precept to date is 10.6 inches. Ford's responded wonderfully. But you got to look down into the ground instead of across like that. When you look down into the uh, uh, land, we found that uh, there's quite a lot of bare ground due to grass mortality. Leaf growth is short. The grasses didn't produce a whole lot of forage that's short forage, but a lot of seed stalks. And looks can be deceiving. And so caution is called for caution. So uh, this is what I'm going to go through the process last week that went through from a 2014 grazing planning. We look at a pasture out here. <clears throat> Look at it and say, well, golly, how many cattle can I run? Or will this, is there enough forage here to run the present number of cattle that we've got for the next X number of days, uh, our, our non-growth period, non-dormant uh, period, our drought period, whatever it is, you come up with a number of days there. So how big of an area would it take to feed one animal unit for one day? Or how many animals can you put on an acre for one day? And it's pretty hard to estimate that. Um, it, and so what we do is to, to determine how big of an area it would take to run one cow for one day. And, um, and, and uh, you can get a visual estimate. Well, gosh, this is, you know, you can get 25 pounds of forage here or whatever for one cow for one day or, or however you want to do it. Um, uh, Kirk Gadzi is an expert at this. And so, but I need to. I need to do something else. I've got to have some hard facts behind it. And so I, I have a one yard square uh, frame that I throw out there and, and I and, uh, randomly throw it out there, clip it, weigh it, and calculate the square yards per animal unit for one day. And um, from that um, data, then I can go out here and I can, that my, my, my figures show that it takes 270 square yards to feed one cow for one day. The square root of that is approximately 16 by 16. So I can step off 16 steps and then get a visual estimate. And this is based on my clipping. And uh, now I've got this in mind and now I can go out there to my other pastures that are of similar vegetative type, uh, soil type, and come up with an estimate. Uh, some pastures may look better than this, so I can decrease this size. There may be some areas that don't, doesn't look this uh, good. Uh, maybe a little more bare ground, maybe uh, uh, different species of grasses, whatever. Uh, then I need to increase the size here. But what it does is it gives you an estimate of what it takes to, to uh, graze one cow for one day, one animal uh, for one day. And the formula uh, that we use here, um, this is from the clippings. And we know how much a cow is going to eat in one day. And this is from my clippings. And so you come up with square yards, feed one cow for one day. The square, root, uh, the square root of that figure then gives us the number of steps. You take the square acres, or the square yards in an acre, which is 4,840, divided by your square yards per AD, which was 270 in our previous slide. And that will give you how many animals you can run for one day on one acre. And then, <clears throat> and that's for that site. Um, I'll get two or three of these estimates per pasture, average them out, and then that times your pasture size will give you the total animal days in that pasture. Or for the ranch, they'll give you the total animal days on that ranch. So I do it by pasture. And I've got the formula across the top. I've got the pastures on the far left, and I go through the formula. And over here, I end up with the animal days of, uh, of uh, forage in each pasture. I total it up, and then uh, I, s I get a total animal days for the ranch. That's grazing or forage production. Then I, 
I, I say, well, I want to utilize 60% of it, and 40% then will be for wildlife, for watershed, whatever. And this can vary from pasture to pasture. Um, we have about 20% canopy from brush, uh, the face of the cap rock, et cetera, et cetera. My final, my, my uh, uh, non-dormant period that I want to plan for is 368 days. So when you go through the formula here, you come up then with a total number of available animal days for the livestock. Then I'll allocate those animal days to the livestock that's there right now, including horses, bulls, goats, whatever you've got. And that gives me either a surplus in animal days or a, um, a deficit. That tells me that I can either add livestock or I can hold my calves over for X number of days or that I need to sell something. And this is just something I put together just to show kind of how our stocking rates, I've been doing this uh, since 1980 and uh, every year we do drought planning and uh, it's, it's, it's just synonymous with, with grazing planning. And <clears throat> so when we uh, first started operating the ranch, um, we took in yearlings. And this was a stocking rate. Conventional in that area is about 50, they say. So we're running 86%, 83%. 2007 was a very dry year. We ended up taking the yearlings off early. 2008 was dry until August. And so that uh, we just didn't have the cattle on there except for a handful of uh, cows. And later that fall and that spring, well, then we bought some cattle and restocked our own cattle. Uh, by taking in cattle up here for the first three years, that gave us uh, instant cash flow that allowed us to go ahead and, and uh, do the infrastructures that we needed to, uh, to put onto the ranch there to um, be able to graze one herd of cattle, to be able to water them adequately, and to be able to uh, plan our grazings. Uh, and so when we stocked up in, in 2009, we were 107% of conventional. There's 139, 139. The drought hit. We opted. We didn't have to, but we opted to sell off and just ride this out. So we're down to 28% here. And, and I really questioned that decision for several months, and then that was the best decision we made as we went further and further into the year. Every time I saw any of my neighbors hauling big bales of hay out to their cows, I thought, yeah, we did all right there. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> so we've been increasing our um, capacity in, in 2013. We're going to add, even though our, uh, my drought planning showed that we could increase our stocking rate by 48 cows on the ranch, uh, we're only going to put about 20 or 25 on. This drought's not over. So we're going to be conservative. And so we'll be at 70%. And, and, and it's a... Uh, you know, you can parlay all of this into economics and everything else, and it uh, it makes it a tough, tough uh, road to hope. Here's an example of drought planning. El Rancho Seco has 200 cows, eight bulls, and four horses. It's been below a below average year, and assuming it doesn't rain next year, we need to know if there's enough grass to hold our cattle till next October. If not, how many do we need to sell? So the forage assessment in November shows we have 120,000 animal days of forage, less 20% for brush canopy. We will leave 40% for uh, soil cover wildlife. That leaves us a total of 57,600 animal days of forage available for livestock for the next 330 days. That's my planning period from November until uh, the next uh, October. And so... <clears throat> They go through the formula and it shows that we have enough forage to run 175 animal units. We're running 212. We know now that we're 37, uh, 37 head above uh, the amount of forage that we have for the next 330 days. The beauty of this is that in November we can make a decision instead of waiting until the following spring, May, you know, May July, when most people will make the decision, they realize, gosh, we're out of feed, then they end up having to sell more than 37 head. We are planning for the drought before it occurs, and we can react to it, or not react to it, but uh, plan for it, 
and uh, and uh, uh, position ourselves to adapt. There's that word. We're going to adapt to it. <clears throat> and so, some of the benefits uh, that we see uh, from grazing planning and drought planning, and they are uh, uh, used together. When I set this out, this is all weeds right here, all forbs, forbs I guess is the correct term. Uh, a lot of bare ground. In 2013, even after three years of drought, our grass is in pretty good shape. Lots of western wheat in here. Another site, you see uh, a lot of uh, forbs. And here we have a lot of grass cover that's come in. And uh, so the land is healing itself. And you can go into the whole water cycle, mineral cycle, the improvements of the to the uh, ecosystem ec ecosystem blocks, the benefits on the wildlife, on the on the human resources on that land, and on the livestock and and everything. And so, um, it's uh, it's come a long way. It's come a long way, baby. Another strategy that we use is to control invasive species. The mesquite and juniper consume, and I don't, we've seen different figures on this, but uh, 20 gallons of water per day. Um, the mesquite and juniper with their root systems utilize uh, the majority of the water that falls, whereas in a grassland you'll get a lot more of that water into the soil root zone. <clears throat> the mesquite and juniper on a big part of this ranch, just like in this area, is, is, is an invasive species. This was grassland uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. It was grassland. And uh, so it costs a little money, and, uh, but it's well worth it for us to, to, to control the brush on this, on this ranch. So on the JX Ranch, just like any other ranch or any other land, the lack of fire and overgrazing in the past 100 years is the primary reason why we have brush inv invasion. Um, you know, we're on the volunteer fire department and, and we're guilty like anybody else. Boy, there's a lightning strike and we run out there and put it out. And it's not the best thing to do. It's part of the natural ecosystem and, and we need to bring fire back or allow it to occur. A density of 45 trees per acre at 20 gallons a tree equals 326,000 gallons of water consumed per year. That's one acre foot of water consumed on one acre of land. So when you've got thousands of acres of, of juniper infestation like you do over the west, that's a lot of water. With an annual rainfall of 16 inches, we should get, it, we, we produce 418,000 gallons of water per acre. Our net result is 92,000 gallons of water available for grass production and aquifer recharge. And this is equivalent to three and a half inches of rainfall per year. Uh, <clears throat> we have a man-made drought right here. And <clears throat> you hear stories about all the wells that are drying up and, and uh, <clears throat> well uh, productivity that's gone down, springs that have dried up. There, not many years ago, there were springs along the cap rock here. Um, we're going to try to bring some of them back, but uh, in the past week, well, I've, I've slaughtered all of these trees right here. What's really interesting on this is that mixed in here were a lot of uh, pinon pine, and when I extricated the uh, juniper out of there, we have a beautiful little pinon pine forest there. And those pinon pine grew straight and tall, in order to grow up above the uh, juniper, and it really looks nice. <clears throat> uh, we're hoping that it's going to improve our turkey habitat. <clears throat> this is also being done with uh, funding from the <clears throat> National Wild Turkey Federation. So some brush work that I've done in the past on our own, um, this one, it doesn't show up as clear, but from, from this point and back behind me, I had cleared an area um, in uh, 2009, and, and the grass really came up good. You can see 
uh, better when you're on the ground, but you can see how the grass is very sparse, not very productive. These trees are taking the uh, the uh, moisture, the rainfall from them, uh, from the grasses. I cut 600 cedar posts in this area. I put the slash into uh, uh, rills, gullies, arroyos. We slowed that water up. We got some sedimentation built up. The grass responded tremendously. We see a lot of western wheat, uh, quite a little bit of uh, Indian rice grass in there too. And <clears throat> this, this pasture is also a special use pasture that uh, we manage specifically for the watershed. So we don't graze it in the summertime. We use it for, for uh, grazing our calves uh, for two or three weeks in the fall. This is uh, a part of the project that I've completed, and so you can see here, um, there's that, those, that tree right there. And you can see the, it, it just opens it up, and it's just gonna make it a beautiful area. Um, <clears throat> this was a, an open grassland in 1946. Our neighbor's father, who was a World War I pilot, took a picture of this area of his house, and the <clears throat> background was this area, and <clears throat> there wasn't a tree or a mesquite bush on one on it. It was it was uh, grassland, and so we're bringing it back to grassland. <clears throat> we do mesquite control. We've done a lot of it under Equip program. Um, in uh, this was uh, there's about a thousand acres that I uh, grubbed with a bulldozer. And you can see, I mean, all the way in the background, you can see all up in here where it's, uh, uh, there's now grassland. On the opposite side of the fence, it's still uh, a lot of uh, mesquite and uh, continuous year-long grazing. A few days ago, the soil moisture at 24 inches was 50%. And <clears throat> on the other side of the fence, it was 35%. And we haven't had any rain in uh, um, eight weeks now. <clears throat> so, you know, that shows that we're having, that we can retain more moisture, that it's going into the, into the uh, uh, ground, into the aquifer, producing more forage. And uh, although I haven't seen an increase in our well production on this particular site, I expect at some point we will. This mesquite is tough. That's about six foot long right there, that taproot. And it broke off right here, so it probably went down another 10 or 12 feet. I have pulled out as many as, as, as long as a 30 foot um, lateral roots. Just pull them out of the ground. This is a little mesquite, about six inches tall, and you can see what kind of a root system it's already got on it. They, it, it goes after that soil moisture and that rainfall. And it takes a machine like that to get that uh, uh, big mesquite. I've, I've, uh, I've brought that uh, dozer to an absolute halt on some of that mesquite. It's just tough. And <clears throat> some of the brush control we're doing with the National Wild Turkey Foundation uh, this year. And you can see <clears throat> on the right the uh, mesquite and juniper trees that we've taken off. Uh, converting this back to a grassland. We leave a few trees, a few big single trunk trees for uh, aesthetics. Also seeing right here some four wing salt bush. We've got some winter fat started right in here and some more right there. And so over a period of time, we should see that increase. This is a site <clears throat> You know, you've seen a lot of these little ridges, sites where the juniper is six, eight foot tall, just as thick as hair on a dog, and nothing underneath it, nothing at all except thick uh, layer of, of duff. And I pushed all that off, and within a, about two years, saw grass beginning to come back in and so in 2013 this is what we've got and this is even after three years of drought 
that site there is going to um, slow down water, slow down the um, impact of rainfall. You're going to allow more water into the soil uh, and build up uh, uh, organic material versus that uh, that had nothing except uh, uh, cedar trees that, I mean, even the wildlife couldn't use it. And <clears throat> all of this was solid uh, juniper also. And when I got the trees out of it, well, there was a lot of hackberry trees. And we're seeing uh, uh, grass coming in there, uh, western wheat, uh, blue grandma, cytos grandma. Another strategy is adding value to our product. Incidentally, this picture is the same as the previous picture. That's the same spot right there. And so uh, I had put some cake around it, some range cubes. That's uh, uh, an example of herd effect, hoof action. And they are there for four or five minutes, and then they're gone. And that site has you know, another uh, year to uh, recover or whatever it's going to do, but we're planting, we're preparing a seed bed and we're planting seeds there. So <clears throat> by adding value to our product, this grazing planning enables us to grow more forage. <clears throat> and through our drought planning and forage assessment, then we can determine how many cattle we can hold over, um, whether we can expand our herd, whether we can hold our calves over for a certain period of time. We take advantage of a higher spring market, thereby adding value to our product. And uh, <clears throat> this is another way we manage for drought. So now we add additional value to our product, grass-fed beef. And uh, we saw about five years ago that there was a demand, a niche market, for uh, uh, local grass-fed beef that's free of antibiotics and hormones and so we began to retain some of these weaned uh, calves and to grow out and slaughter at 16 to 17 months of age. Our customer base has grown from about 8 to 10 uh, in, in, in the year 2008 to a total of 380. <clears throat> we have a stable base of 100 to 150 uh, customers or so and it's growing every year. We retail individual cuts as well as halves, holes, and quarters, and uh, direct sale to the customers, about 60 head a year, and, uh, and the demand is growing every year. By marketing the grass-fed beef, we bypass the stalker and uh, feedlot uh, uh, segments of the conventional livestock industry. Um, that generates more profit for us. And so we run Corianti cows, a few longhorn cows. We add Charlet bulls to them, and that gives us good quality grass-fed beef. That's uh, <clears throat> low marbling, but good fat covering. Customers love it. They, they absolutely like it. Um, Courtney's kids gave the thumbs up on it. So that's great. So this is how we manage for drought. We plan our grazings, we plan for drought, we control brush, and we add value. And each one of these is, uh, none of these stand on their own. They're all uh, co-mingled, they all work together. Um, and, and so uh, it's all one process consisting of a number of steps. Like I said, we plan for a drought. So far, everything's going according to plan. And these guys are happy. So now I'll take uh, any questions anybody has. Mr. Sidwell, thank you for the tone of your talk and having a positive outlook and managing for all this. Uh, being in this business, I know the hardest thing is to follow through and monitor. Um, and I think it'd be really valuable for the climate scientists to understand the sequestering of the carbon that's going on. And I wondered if your ranch is doing that at all. Are you monitoring for the change in the soil car carbon content? I've made contact with a soil scientist 
at the Clovis Ag Experimental Station. And he um, is going to come out and do some soil testing um, in regard to organic matter, microorganisms, um, things like that. And so, yeah, we will do that. We haven't done it. But um, that, it's, that's a plan, a work in progress. Well, thank you for all you are doing. Well, thank you. Yes, ma'am. When you've had to reseed, um, do you spread the seed and you use the cattle to set the seed in the ground? Or leaf uh, gr grass litter is all it needs to, to get going again? To, to reseed your, your, the pastures where there has been grass die off. Um, and, and I didn't catch the first part of your question. Oh, there. when you reseed, because you've had a grass die off from the drought, do you simply spread the seed and use and, and pass cattle over it, over the ground to have the hoof ac action set the seed in the ground? Or do you let the grass litter that's on the ground help be sufficient for setting the seed? Yeah, we do not seed. Oh, you've not had to. No, and and because you know the grass seeds there, it can lay in the soil for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, like this year, where we had some seed production, it's going to spread. And then you use the cattle to help spread it and to help mm -hmm. plant it. You prepare that seed bed and uh, uh, help to cover it. You know, you can't do that on a whole ranch, but you can in some places. And so we're, we selectively pick spots maybe that. Uh, uh, where we had a higher die-off than, than other spots, and we might uh, feed there one day. I don't feed more than one time in, in any one spot, and, and just only in the wintertime uh, as a feed supplement, uh, nutri nutrition supplement to what the grass is putting out. Okay. And uh, so, no, we don't, we don't feed at all, or I mean seed at all. So oh. It's done naturally. That's astonishing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sir. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay. <laughs>